get him out of here. Hello, my name is Rogelio Yola, and I'm looking for a job. Yes, uh, it's a department. I have a college degree from the Instituto Tecnológico de Santo Domingo, and I'm willing to work very hard. I am very well known in the neighborhood. I love New York, and I have excellent reference. Your call is very important to me. Please leave a message, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. The one thing that drove my life was coming to America. The land of opportunities, the land of the free, where all men I created equal. I am willing to travel, work overtime, and my salary, no problem. I will work with your budget. In fact, any offer at this point is a great offer. I'm fully bilingual with a strong skills in computers, and I love to cook lasagna. I'm also a firm believer in the world of the great Ronald Reagan. The past few days when I've been at that window upstairs, I've thought a bit of the shining city upon a hill. The phrase comes from John Winthrop, who wrote it to describe the America he imagined. What he imagined was important because he was an early pilgrim, an early freedom man. He journeyed here on what today we call a little wooden boat. And like the other pilgrims, he was looking for a home that would be free. I've spoken of the shining city all my political life, but I don't know if I ever quite communicated what I saw when I said it. But in my mind, it was a tall, proud city built on rocks stronger than oceans, windswept, God blessed and teeming with people of all kinds living in harmony and peace. A city with free ports that hummed with commerce and creativity. And if there had to be city walls, the walls had doors and the doors were open to anyone with the will and the heart to get here. Make America great again. Get them out of here! Starring Angel Salazar from Scarface. Hollywood Al Pacino. Chichi. Get the yayo! Chichi, get the yayo! Get the hell out of here! <laughs> A very serious comedy about the American dream. Get him out of here! Welcome, welcome once again to the Radical Imagination. I'm your host, Jim Vretos. I'm a sociologist who's taught at John Jay College of Criminal Justice and Yeshiva University here in New York City. The United States has controlled Puerto Rico since 1898 after defeating Spain in the Spanish-American War. It has the status of a U.S. unincorporated territory. As American citizens since 1917, Puerto Ricans can be drafted into the military, pay payroll taxes, and help fund programs like Medicaid and SNAP, but are unable to vote for president don't have a voting representative in Congress, and have almost no access to federal safety net programs, even though more than 40% of the island lives in poverty. Its history of revolution and terror has largely been overlooked, from the unsuccessful armed insurrection in 1950 to the modern day struggle for self-determination, autonomy and independence, military occupation, colonial rule, political intrigues, FBI and CIA covert activity, and prison riots have accompanied this tumultuous period in Puerto Rican history. Today on The Radical Imagination, we welcome two powerful voices to help us remember this narrative and the war against all Puerto Ricans. Linda Barreri Barrero is a distinguished linguist and lexicographer she holds a doctoral degree from the University of Salamanca in Spain, along with degrees from the Royal Academy in Madrid and the University of Puerto Rico. Her work centers around the field of semiotics, the analysis of signs and symbols in language. She's used this approach to write extensively on the massive, cynical, 
an adroit manipulation of entire nations like Puerto Rico. We're also thrilled to have Nelson Dennis back on the show for the third time. Nelson was the editor editorial director of Eldario La Pranza, has served as a New York State Assemblyman, is a longtime community activist, and directed the feature film Make America Great Again. He's the author of the classic, widely praised War Against All Puerto Ricans. And as always, it's a joy to have Judy Jorish back to co-host. She brings decades of experiences and political wisdom as a community organizer and activist familiar with the colorful and contentious political battles of the city. She's the founder of a groundbreaking music and health wellness initiative called Breathe the Music Network, creating democracy network that addresses childhood asthma and cutbacks in in-school music programs. So thank you all for being here today thank on you. the Radical thank Imagination. You. And it's, it's really a pleasure and a, and a blessing and great as always to have Judy as a co-host. And Linda, can we start with your work on semiotics? Explain a little bit to our audience what that field is about and how you've used it in ways to illustrate the way in which Puerto Rico and, and other nations have been manipulated and, and have uh, been exploited in a sense. Well, Jim, thanks a lot for the opportunity. Uh, I mentioned before that this was uh, my second book. It was actually right. the thesis that I defended at the University of Salamanca in Spain. Mm -hmm. And it's all really related to discourse, religious discourse and cognitive manipulation. The book is only in Spanish. And as uh, we'll see later, I use the symbol of dollars instead of the S on the title, mm -hmm. discourse, religious discourse. They both mm -hmm. words are using the symbol of dollar instead of the S. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, this is just the beginning of my research. Um, when you mention manipulation, I will just go all the way back to the beginning of this research to explain you why uh, not only me, but anyone without any academic background in linguistics yeah. will think this is manipulation. Right. The church, which is named uh, in Spanish, Iglesia Fuente de Agua Viva, or Fountain of Living Waters, started in Puerto Rico with only 30 people in mm. a parking lot. Mm -hmm. Mm. 30 years later, the original preacher was a multimillionaire, mm. mm. and there was not only 78 different buildings in every single town of the 78 towns in Puerto Rico, but they also jump to the U.S. and later to Latin America. Wh when was the year that this got started? They in started in 1974. 74, 74. Wow. Okay. yes. Hmm. Uh, that was, in the beginning, was my uh, master thesis at the University of Puerto Rico. They were celebrating 30 years, and at the time it was, it was wonderful. Uh, they had this stadium for 2,000, probably more mm -hmm. people, uh, and that was the main temple of this church. And we have to consider that 30 years before, they have nothing but a parking lot, one preacher, and a couple of people that they just started to hear what this person was saying. He doesn't have any, and this is very interesting because there is nothing related to religious in this uh, academic background of the founder. Mm. He was just a seller of shoes, mm. Mm. but mm. he was very sharp, very clever. In so what, what was, was his message? What was he trying to get across? How was he, it, it, this became a big deal in Puerto Rico and, and influential in political circles as well? Well, uh, first of all, he used the theology of prosperity. That mm -hmm. was the doctrine of his. Yeah. It like was Reverend Protestant. Ike in Yeah, New Reverend York. Ike. Yeah. Yes, exactly. We have that here. So let me just say, so he was not 
uh, officially connected to any Christian denomination. So he wasn't Pentecostal or Protestant or Catholic. It was Protestant, and now it is defined as neo-Protestant because they, they really develop and include all these modernities as technology, for example, in the incursion of this uh, religious discourse. And that's yes. why it, it is very effective. Well, certainly was Luther wanted a church of prosperity oh, yes. and hard work also, so it, it, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yes, it makes the, sense. The Protestant it. Revolution Protestant it set yes. up a church that was consistent with capitalism, so. It makes yeah. sense, yes, yeah. of course. Hmm. Uh, then it has been very effective if we look at the results of this, 40 years later, it has been very effective. And as I mentioned, the theology of prosperity is the base of his doctrine. Um, he used to have uh, a lot of young people, and this is very interesting because as part of the discourse, he would say, raise your Bible, raise your iPad, raise your cell phone to the sky, mm. because they use the electronic version of the Bible. Mm. Then that, that makes a huge difference. We don't have elder people as when we go to the Catholic Church, we used to see a lot of elder people, unfortunately. Uh, and, and everybody will think this is going to end soon because it is a time mm -hmm. for generations, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it has been very clever for him to do this. Then people will go there. They don't need a Bible. They just go. Mm -hmm. and look it up so on their cell phones, then when you see that, and I use um, the seven Troy uh, participatory observation theory, so you have to go to that place and see what is happening indeed, then you see a lot of young people, tight dresses, high heels, salsa music, no. 2,000 people together using iPads and iPhones. Networking, no right? Networking in the sense to enhance their financial oh, yes. capability. So that's that right. It was all about business. And mm -hmm. for example, just to uh, show you how they were so effective that the common people with any academic background and Businessmen as well will tell him, well, they had this pyramid business. And for example, you will go to these meetings and he will say, I want you to sell 100 products this week. That they were manufacturing or they oh, were promoting yeah. mm. Yeah. their products. Right. So mm. will get the, the mm. church will get mm. profit of this. Right. You're mm. going to change your watch mm -hmm. from the right to the left hand or either if you Use it on the left, then you change it to the right hand. And every day, every time, when you see that your watch is on the other hand that you're not used to, you remember you have to do this for your church. This is for God. Mm -hmm. Then you think about this. <laughs> this is not for God. Right. Who is getting the profit of this? And he uses the theology of prosperity, and there is an equivalent of the money with the faith, the bigger your donation or the profit that mm. you provide to this church, the bigger your faith for God is. Yes. Then there is an equivalency of that. Money provided to the church from your own pocket symbolizes your faith for God. Very what were the connections, if any, with America? and some of the political and religious leaders here. Well, when you enter to this uh, main temple, which is like a stadium, 2,000, maybe more, 2,300 people can fit there, you see the Statue of Liberty, the crown of the Statue of Liberty on top of the main scenery. It's a huge place, mm. so you can see it from more than, I would say, 500 feet away, you can see it. And that makes you understand this is all about progress. Of course, there's a connection with the American culture. Mm -hmm. And people will think okay. about this not only from the religious perspective, but somehow, yes, there's politics and there's the American culture embedded with this, which is not wrong, of course, but it is also useful 
for the, um, the people that, that he's trying to get into this group as right. members, as official members. Then the main temple, for example, it was like a shopping mall. Mm. Right. It was a place where you have stores, you have libraries, you have accountants that will provide the service to individuals there. You had travel agencies. If you had kids and you want to go there, no problem. You just so it took a lot of will take care of useful there. energy that might have gone elsewhere politically and 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 allowed what um, Puerto Ricans, in a sense, to be further divided because this did reach the great masses who we've we understand are the 40% of the island, right? This wasn't, was how this meant How prominent was it? Yeah, how prominent was it in that community? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, it was very powerful in terms of politics. The founder, which was Rodolfo Fon, that was the name of the founder, is now in Texas. He used to have oh. breakfast with the governors in Puerto Rico right. every Sunday, and it was published on the media. Then. Mm. Uh, you don't have any doubt about it when now, just two weeks ago, Governor Pierluisi announced that this church is going to get 30.5 million in FEMA funds for, to rebuild this temple that wow. was damaged by Hurricane wow. Maria, which happens in 2017. So wow. that was five, six years ago. But now they were getting all this money. Now they're finally getting the funds they should have But gotten. no, the, no, this is, you're talking no. about it's to rebuild the church. It's not even right. to no, go right. to the, the members. Exactly. It's not even to go to the needs of the members who may have been devastated by the hurricane. Of course. So mm -hmm. he, to the uh, but in know, the he name of FEMA. The, yes, but funds. he learned from, right. you know, the so American another, evangelicals. Yeah. Right. He learned from the American, American evangelical um, Christian nationalists. The, the big tent right. uh, sort of churches, how to raise money off of the church and build their political power from that position. So he controlled votes, he controlled money, he probably, mm -hmm. I'm sure you looked as whether he was making political contributions in order to develop that relationship with the governor of Puerto Rico. That doesn't happen uh, by religious fiat. That's, that's money and votes that he's able to deliver. Well, I'm not an attorney, but as long as I know, there is a separation according to the constitution of state and church mm -hmm. for many religious affairs. Yeah, We're, you're looking. The church can't give money, but he can get his constituents individually to give money. Right. He can bundle money from his base. To, that but would be, I, I mean, I'm speculating. I have no legit? idea if that's true. You looked at Nelson there, who is an attorney. Well, there's a um, there's an over, uh, overarching principle at work now uh, because of Citizens United that you know it's kind of like the Wild West of funding. But if you can give money anonymously and ostensibly with no relation between the donor and the recipient, the, the uh, federal legislator, that's a complete sham. There's no way you're going to give ten million dollars and the, and the legislator the doesn't know right. where it's coming from or right. what strings mm -hmm. may or may not be attached. So. Given the fact that the Supreme Court of the United States has legitimized massive, the Koch brothers and all these that can give money right and left, um, mm -hmm. I would say this is just following in a, in a hallowed American tradition at this point. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. okay. and they could, you know, you're right that mm -hmm. a church cannot be seen to support a political candidate. Right, not uh, not ostensibly. Ostensibly, right. they can't the support a political is, candidate, but yeah. individual members of the church yeah. are citizens who have the right. To give to whomever Whatever they want, right. and if they're listening to their leaders about who they should, you know, who has been good to the church, of so there are many ways to convey that that's who you should be supporting, without the church making a contribution. But it would be clear that they delivered a certain amount of money. Yeah, and uh, pursuant to the city of United, you can create not, with a five hundred one c three. There's a five hundred one c four, and five hundred one c, and that's per pursuant to the IRS code, which operates and is as the, the federal the political uh, law of the land advocacy. in Puerto Rico as well. Yeah. Um, and the 501c4 is, is the funnel for these anonymous donations. So I'm guessing that a, a church could use, uh, create, create its own 501c4 mm -hmm. and it wouldn't be traceable be because Citizens United protects them, their anonymity. 
Isn't that, you know, isn't that wild? Yes, wild. but I don't. I, I, I think a 501c4 is still. That's, uh, that's why they call it dark money. They do have the, um, they can do advocacy and political work that a 501c3 can't do. And the difference is that if you give to that institution, your contribution isn't tax deductible. But they remain a nonprofit. But that's the distinction that donors don't get a, a write off. But like corporations do, they direct their employees to, to give, give to, to, to certain yeah. people. The way you can bypass it is that the individuals over whom you have influence can act as individual citizens, and they're not representing the church. Um, but you can, in a way, bundle, you know, yeah. you could either bundle them, and as Nelson's saying, give anonymously through these PACs, these um, uh, uh, mega donors. I have a question for you mm. in your book. Um, did you use, uh, was that the main uh, example, the main uh, analogy that, that, that carried the, 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 your thesis? Or were there, did you encounter lots of other examples that comprise that, you know, of discourse analysis that, that exemplify this? this uh, there are many examples. Um, this is an 800 pages thesis because oh. I had to do this in Spain. They require me a lot of uh, uh, pages, essentially more than 500. So yes, there's a lot of material, mm -hmm. many examples about this. Then we also included, I also included, for example, the ethnography of communication analysis. Then if we uh, try to understand and analyze why this discourse is so effective, mm. then we of course need to analyze much more than that. The pro pro uh, prosperity. The, uh, the theology discourse. of prosperity. The theology, right. Why so, it is, why is it so, why it is so effective that, for example, yeah. uh, the main uh, preacher and founder of this church, he used to use the vest the clothes, the dresses of the popes, the Catholic popes. Mm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Beautiful gold color mm. with the cross in front and the cross behind. This is not a mm. Catholic church. Right. But he was doing this, and by doing this, <coughs> he takes the authority of the Catholic system. Absolutely. Because at the end, we were a colony of Spain over 500 years, yeah. so mm. people still respecting Catholicism, and there is an authority. Absolutely. Even if yeah. you're a Protestant or any other religion, well, this is it. Yeah. It's uh, I got another question. And Puerto Rico, you know, Gigi Avila, right? And there's um, the, the use of media, like radio ministry. Oh, so yeah. did, did, did they do that? Did they have an adroit, you know, specific use of the media? Well, this is very interesting because if you go back, in the beginning of the TV, and I have a whole chapter of my thesis about this, Gigi Avila said, no, we don't want the TV, because this TV they call La Caja del Diablo, mm. the box of devil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then, who was the first, the first preacher and the first church in Puerto Rico to have their own radio and TV stations? <laughs> and they will rent that to other right. mm -hmm. churches. And so he just wanted to get a leg up on everyone. So, oh, yeah. he, so he just yes. wanted to discourage everyone else. So could he, he could be the firstest with the this most. This was very interesting because Gigi Avila will bring people right. and they will say, bring all the TVs from your home and sure. they will crush it in like the books. rivers in mm -hmm. Puerto Rico because that was the devil inside a box. The media is your enemy. We hear that. That was in the very yeah, too, beginning. Then he no. realized there was a lot of profit not, coming out of this. Right. For their own purposes, right? Mm -hmm. so That's it. So they would baptize the television and then he had right. a radio and TV repair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, right. you, That's it, yeah. yeah. Hmm. It's very timely because, yeah. you know, obviously yes. we're talking right. about the, the use of language starting, you know, with the advent of fascism and control of reality mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. of any tyrannical regime. And um, uh, Marsha Gessen talks about this a lot, like the difference between a Putin and tyranny and uh, a dictatorship, which where a society where you want everybody to go home, lock the doors and not participate mm -hmm. in politics mm -hmm. and an authoritarianism where they want everybody to come out and, and march in lockstep and to spout 
the same messages to everybody and to control people's thinking. To the be true part of the true believers, the true believers. So the Eric the, Hoffer, right. the um, yeah. which is what a Franco is doing, what a Putin tries to do, which is different than just a repressive regime mm -hmm. that tries to stamp out opposition. This requires total devotion to the leader, to the thought process. And so mm -hmm. that, that's what you're describing here is mm -hmm. a, a neophyte coming in and creating his own ideology and his own following. But it's something that we're looking at here as mm -hmm. to how meaning is destroyed. So we're not even speaking the same language yeah, in yeah. divided communities in America because they're defining words to mean something else. So we can, it destroys democracy, it destroys community because words don't mean the same thing to people. So how do you have a conversation if you can't even agree on the meaning of words or if the television, I can see why he would say the television is the devil and why he wants people just to look on their phones because he controls what they can see. He can control what they read. They're not doing Bible oh. study. They're quote, which the Catholic Church also reduces. Catholics don't read the Bible, they read the catechism. They just learn the simple mantra. So it's, a, it's social control in the total sense. And this is somebody who came along and said, well, I'm gonna create my own world and my own base of support and, and manipulate in that way. But it's, he's using an age old method and that we're experiencing here today. How do we talk to each other when you know, words a, are, and people are demonized? Yeah. It, it's a national condition, uh, what I would call, call national sensory agnosia. Sensory agnosia is a neurological condition where the mind, you see, every, you see here, uh, the, the, the five senses are completely intact, but it, it, the mind doesn't really register them and doesn't, there's no pattern recognition. Um, mm. And in a sense, would you, would you say this, that it is a, it's the greatest level of subjugation because it's not just p domination; it's internalizing it exactly. to the point where yeah. you, uh, you you have you have to have, they don't even have it's like a you know a, an elephant that you can tether it with a little thing and they get so used to it that they won't move they're immobilized yes. by that so the slightest I'm asking this is a question I'm long way of asking but <laughs> would you say that that that's uh, part of what this discourse that's is is that the the uh, the internal internalization of the of the subjugator so much that there's no boundaries. You you know you identify so completely that it's like a Stockholm syndrome. Yeah, you're right about that. It is. Uh, and Jim, you're a sociologist, mm -hmm. so you know that this is what we recognize as social cognition. Social cognition includes knowledge, moral values, beliefs attitudes and ideologies yep. they control all of them together and this is when we have this result as you mentioned there's total control over it and as you also mentioned dictators for example then to even go further on this example we mentioned the FEMA phones mm -hmm. yeah. now this church is going to get 3.5 millions of dollars in FEMA funds to reconstruct the building of the structure of this church, okay? Then what about the parishioners? Yes. How much are they getting? Yeah. Many yeah. of them, they lost their houses. They right. didn't get anything. Are they going to say something? No, they're not going to say something because- But they're, they're made to feel satisfied since the church oh, is yes. getting it. And, yes. and I was just wondering as you're talking, yes, uh, that's why it's partly this shows around because we want to offer that alternative vision, the radical imagination. Mm -hmm. And I, as you were talking, I was thinking of the movie you made, Make America Great. How is that tied in as a way of responding to that false reality or playing with that, those distortions, if you well, will? Simplic speaking T simplistically. Tell us a little about it's that, that uh, movie, yeah, that, how it connects with oh, It's the story of a guy that comes to Washington Heights to, from, from the Dominican Republic to help, right. his, um, help his sister who's, who's ailing. And uh, he, he tries to get a job, he tries to do everything right, and yet he ends up being a The prosperity right gospel. Chase. He has it. Yeah, he believed it so utterly. So um, in a very simplistic, uh, in its simplest um uh, distilled version is just a recognition that the American dream is, you know, essentially a, a dream. Okay, it's a construct, and it's ever an ever receding horizon. And that is part of the mythology, though, that has helped this country. 
yeah. we, during the, the existence of a frontier, it, it actually was real. There was a prosperity because it was, you know, go west, yes. your man. Right. The fact that you have to, you know, praise God, pass your ammunition and kill a, a few Native Americans. Well, that was beside the point. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, supposedly. But, you know, that whole march and that whole gold rush mentality. And um, I would think that, again, that's part and parcel of, you know, you create a myth. Right. And right. Get everyone to subscribe to it. Mm. And then and then you can jigger that that myth and, you know, basically it, it be like a puppet master because you're the one that creates the message. Right. But you, and you see some people prospering. And I guess Trump and his family went west and and got rich, too, as a uh, well, they didn't go. Well, they went to Coney Island. They went and they were, <laughs> no, no. But they, they, there was some uh, distant relatives that went gold mines and stuff. But but yeah, that that myth of the frontier that's always open there for uh, and so to exploit. And so, isn't that uh, analogous to to you know, yeah. th that that sense of the, of a true believer that that you know that they. They, they subscribe to something that sometimes is just mere nostalgia. It doesn't even exist anymore. Yeah. But yeah. like the Trump people, they're mm. trying to cre uh, believe in an America that doesn't never really existed, and yet they insist insist that it's been taken away from them. And so um, mm. it's a redefinition of life, of you know, of, of community, and and um, it's very pernicious. And I'm glad that you that you exposing it. Yes. Well, it's, yes. Yeah. This is a, it's totally a different topic, but yes. Uh, we have all these people of God, as they call themselves, people of God. And, and they, they do have the personality to attract all these people and manipulate them. And this is, it is very interesting to see how they do it. And they get millions of dollars out of the, your pockets because you believe in God and you have to... Uh, provide a donation to God and that will be the equivalent to your faith in God. But yeah. the reality is that money is not going anywhere but to his own pocket. Yeah. Yeah. Well, think of those magnificent churches throughout the Middle Ages that were built from the, the pennies and the sweat and blood of the most the impoverished masses. Mm -hmm. masses throughout Europe, right. but they and Russia. erected these magnificent, yes, Europe and Russia and, and elsewhere, and erected these magnificent, so it, these magnificent cathedrals. But it's, um, the question for me at this is, this has been a standard means of self-enrichment and social control. The church has been so, uh, worked so hand in hand with governments have been the governments, mm -hmm. you know, that's why in France there's such a, uh, you know, the revolution was not just uh, against the government, but against the church. And um, w America has freedom of religion. The French, because of the hatred of the church, have freedom from religion and have all kinds of rules pre preventing kids from wearing religious symbols in schools, they're, you know, much more repressive of religious expression. Um, because Muslim of women the, too as well. Yes, because of, exactly, because of their yeah. old experience of being oppressed by the church. So here, America is mm. really one of the most demonstratively religious countries on the planet because right. mm -hmm. people participate in their churches. It's the form of community, but um, it's been used both for good and for for progress and mm. for repression because it was also the church that led the civil rights movement those mm -hmm. the black church was has been one of the greatest forces of yeah. progress and the conscience of america throughout mm -hmm. its history so distinguishing from religion that gives people agency and religion and language that prevents people from mm -hmm. acting in their own interests is um, is something that I don't think people have really talked about a lot in this country that we see it's existed but I right. don't know that we're really talking about the language that of liberation theology of liberation yes, for example yes. versus the theology yeah. of oppression and you're sort of getting to how it was this new out of nothing from a parking lot religion right. that took hold in Puerto Rico. Um, so it's not, 
you don't need the authority of a thousand years to establish mm -hmm. that kind of relationship. It's um, the wonders of capitalism. You know, could I, could I, could yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah I, sure, I'm, sure. I'm going to give an, an analogy and tell me if you if 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 I'm in the ballpark, and then mm -hmm. I'll, I'll ask you if you mm -hmm. can think of others. Would you say that Scientology would mm -hmm. be sort of oh. an, an analogy on the modern scene here mm -hmm. in the United States that yeah. that it, that shows that kind of uh, that radical mental penetration? Uh, and are there others here in the United States that, that come to mind for you? It does. And Scientology, for example, uh, to make sure you understand that it does, it is banned in the European countries. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, the person that is now, hmm. and I cannot remember his name right yeah. now. Uh, L. Ron Hubbard? Uh, and the United Nations and well, dealing with this uh, Russian Ukraine war. He banned um, every single sect because he defined this as sex, and, and they are, uh, from entering the European countries. That Scientology, they tried to open a huge, beautiful building in Madrid, and mm. they said no. The mm. Spanish mm. said no, or the European Union? The European Mo Union. The right. European Union. Well, they went along. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but I couldn't. Yes. I, I happen to agree Joseph that Borrell. Mm -hmm. Joseph Borrell, it has been basically uh, the only person that decided for the European countries only, we're not going to accept this type of sex in the European countries, and they redacted a law against the sex. The European Parliament must have passed it. It wasn't unilaterally. Exactly. Not one man who did So they're it, all but banned. But the Parliament, although they're not elected, but yeah. Scientology, uh, they try who, to open Who else it have they banned? banned? I'm just curious. Are other... Uh, Oops, like that, well, for example, curious. Scientology was banned. Right. This church from Puerto Rico, because they, they expanded to the uh -huh. U.S., they expanded to Latin America, and of oh. course they tried to go into Spain. It's a Spanish-speaking country, so it's also right. a, a good place for business with God, of course. They're banned uh, there. It, well, Joseph Borrell banned not only them, but any type of sect that would like to have their own buildings and, and institutions out hmm. there. That's outside of organized religion. But let's take a look at mm. um, the, the forces, the evangelicals within established and more traditional churches that are working in concert with the far right and are working against immigration. They're, they're nationalist but they're working internationally in concert. So that's their contradiction, that they organize around nationalism, yeah. and yet they're working together internationally. So um, we were speaking off camera before about Opus Dei, or Opus Dei, which is a religious, a, a traditionalist, far-right, extremist Catholic group within the Catholic Church internationally that began also with one young priest, but it was within Catholicism, in, con in concert with Franco's fascist dictatorship in Spain. And it grew first in Spain, mm -hmm. building a lay organization of masses of men and women who became disciplined members of the Catholic Church, not clergy, but lay people, who implemented and enforced Franco's fascist regime, and including, for example, in 2011, it was revealed that in Catholic hospitals and community centers, they stole over 300,000 Spanish babies. Mm. They took them from poor single mothers who were associated with the defending the Republic against Franco. They killed the mothers, took the children, renamed them, and distributed them to right-wing families to adopt them to get rid of the red gene, the communist mm. gene, in yeah. these um, progressive, Republican-supporting women. And it's only now just coming out. There was a trial in 2018, the, the stolen babies of Spain, that this same method was then repeated in Chile, Argentina, Argentina yeah. was most famous about the, the because of the mothers of the plaza, right. who mm -hmm. stood in the plaza for decades they became the grandmothers of the plaza, holding up the pictures of their murdered children and saying, where are my grandchildren? So this started, though, under Frankel with Opus Dei. And what people 
we're talking about the very conservative six members of the nine members of the Supreme Court. But what people don't talk about is that they're all members and associated with the far right Catholic sect inside the church, coordinated through Opus Dei. The head of the Federalist, it sounds conspiratorial, but the head of the Federalist Society, who has created all the nominations for the Supreme Court, Leo Leonard, I mean, Leonard Leo, is on the board of directors of Opus Dei in the United States. And I just wish that the papers would talk about this more. Right. Has it been more of a manifestation of, of various Protestant of, of visions? I mean, no. in the past, it's always been, you know, but when no. Billy Graham was the one that anointed they, but the next this president. This, hmm. there's, well, I know that's that was a the, while ago, but that's of course the. But what's the analogy here? The analogy well, is Catholics. here is that and it's a Puerto sect Rico. within a church. So this is a sect, a spin-off of Protestantism, to okay. support a particular politic and to enrich those people. This is a sect within the Catholic Church that uses the umbrella of a traditional religion to support a, a politic. In this country too. All over the world. It's in right. Vox in Spain. Steve Bannon has been creating the international linkages mm -hmm. of Opus Dei that um, now has six members of the Supreme Court. Everyone thinks the Supreme Court are white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. And we're not aware, it was a shock to me to realize that it's, this isn't anti-Catholic, this right. is anti-right-wing sect right. inside of it. This is the tradition mm. coming from the Inquisition of mm. Catholicism. Mm. It's not, right. most it's Catholics in America are much yeah. more right. liberal than Opus Dei. Right. Opus Dei is discredited in Spain because it's associated with Franco. But it's mm. subliminally working in institutions here to move the country to a religious right because of the social control you can exert through but, religious language. But don't language. we think about it more in terms of the Christian fundamentalists? But we, they are fundamentalists, but, just but as they're Protestant, a Jewish fundamentalist. I mean, I'm sorry, Protestant. But that's what we we're see, trying to dis yeah, we want to see disprove. The that fundamentalism exists fundamentalism in every generally. sect and Whether every it's denomination. Whether Jewish or Muslim and so exactly. on. I think that's, yeah, that was, that's an important point, I think. If, if I could in, interject it. something that has- Interject, really, interject. Has no, interject. No, no particular relation, but I think I would, I would do a disservice to our, to our audience here if I didn't uh, uh, share the fact that Iris Chacon, when the moral Here's majority it. came in without Ronald Reagan in 1980, Iris Chacon, Here's became saying. a born-again Christian and a Pentecostal minister in order to facilitate her getting FCC licenses so that she could broadcast here in the United States. Now, you got to tell Steve that, 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 that very oh, sexy... Uh, yeah. 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 It was a vedette. You, yeah. It was a vedette, it, and it's, it's, it's interesting So she got bought off for that? It's, she was part no, of the church, something and then out, they... Oh, she figured, okay, Yeah, apparently she Here's, didn't have any money to donate to the church, so she, she donated 20... Her, uh, a ring of $25,000 worth it, and then I they see. had to go to the court, and there was a big issue on the media. With Can you Edith explain Chacon a little bit more who she is? Yeah, the that's Chacon for the older. Uh, sex symbol, and she had yes. the, what, the Edith Chacon show, right? Yeah. It was very voluptuous, very yeah. voluptuous. For, for an hour, but basically, with different <laughs> outfits, but that's all it was. And she had a great international following, yeah. and, I, <laughs> and I was, you know, I, you I followed the Manhattan her. chapter of the Edith Chacon Society practice. I'm sure you did. Yeah. yeah. It, it was just what fun. is interesting is she was a good in, dancer. But in Puerto Rico, that was a familiar <laughs> show. The whole family will sit <laughs> there <laughs> to see this vedette with a G-strong. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was, just, I, she was, it was a, a yeah. porno star, but it was a familiar show. Yeah. At eight o'clock every single day, people would just, the yeah. whole family would just. The family. Yeah. They, they, they would create the trappings the of a variety show, the yeah. trappings, but it, and, and every <laughs> Set, every set, it, it ended up with her shaking her ass at the camera. It, that was. Yeah, there you, you can, go. You there can, was, you can check there it out. There yeah. approvals. She had to become a born-again Christian. And and the religious right accepted that. They, she was part of the, of the, of the, of the and, group. And then she could penetrate this here, is, no pun intended. Yeah, no. no uh, right. Because then she, the show was able to migrate into the United States. That she was allowed then to. Uh, and look, I mean, the, well, the fascist voice piece here under the McCarthy era, the, what in the 30s and 40s was Father Coughlin, 
who was the Catholic priest who had a radio show, mm -hmm. millions of followers, mm -hmm. That's true. using yeah, um, religious language, using, you know, as it's been attributed to so many people, you know, that when fascism comes to America, to be wrapped mm -hmm. in an American flag and holding a Bible. And that's what people learned and understood. You know, the founding fathers were very suspicious of religion and its hold on, they came here for religious freedom, not for religious control of the population. So, so in that sense, could it be said that that original discourse analysis is, is that uh, a, 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 had, there's a tremendous lo long, centuries long tradition to it, that when we vieron los conquistadores, they came in with Bibles, that's right? right? They came in with missionaries, right? And so well, that uh, was the initial discourse. For example, John Lancaster, when he entered uh, in Latin America as a Protestant, and he started the Protestant reform in Latin America, what we did was use the Bible to educate the children, and he used it, and there was nothing else to use, as a tool to start teaching the students, the children at that time, to read. They didn't know how to read. Mm, so there mm. was nothing else. And this is how he also kept them. The Catholicism was there for 500 years, exactly as it happened in Puerto Rico. Uh, over 500 years, there was no universities in Puerto Rico. Right. But the Americans came in 898. And in 1903, <laughs> five years later, they opened the University of Puerto Rico this until today, the state university. Mm. Then when I went to the University of Salamanca, that has been there for 800 years. Mm -hmm. And of course you ask yourself, but you were 500 years in Puerto Rico. There was a colony where you had a lot of money and profits and benefits and you name it. But you were the, yeah. the But you never cow. opened an institution on higher education. Right. So we had to wait until the Americans came and Washington DC finally oh, opened a state university with higher education that is until today, a hundred years later, right. the state university. Then, I mean, we have to be clear about that. Uh, this so, didn't happen before. But are there any dissident voices, progressive religious voices? I mean, uh, akin to, let's say, Reverend William Barber's Poor People's Campaign, in which he argues that the people you're talking about are, are distorting the, the, um, the well, Christian is, message. Is mm -hmm. there anything like that in, in, in Latin America? Or, or you talked about liberation theology. Yeah, but it's very strong. Is it strong in Puerto Rico? Have they pushed back on, on this other group you're talking about? Well, What's going on there? Um, I think they're pretty powerful. The people like it a lot. What? They had a young population and that is important because they provide other sources and they accept other attitudes that for example fundamental not only catholicism but, but even the protests, protests yeah they are very say, restrictive yeah so the, they're used to that and yes look askance at, mm -hmm. at the liberate so so they need to see are nelson's you, movies more yeah. oh yeah no bring it and as I dimension, mentioned, right? the governor <laughs> just announced yeah. $34.5 million to rebuild this. And this is a private but company. Who, makes that, who made that decision yeah. at FEMA that it should go? It's on the news. And as we mentioned FEMA, maybe I will go to that letter that you wanted to mention before. That it should be protested. People, uh, yeah. people should protest. There was a lot of people who didn't receive anything yes. and uh, about... Four years ago, when the earthquake happened, back in 2020, I was working in the Middle East. Someone said there has been an earthquake in Puerto Rico. Yeah. The whole Southwest is devastated. And I just did what I can do, right. I can right. do anything about it. <clears throat> I felt very sad about this. Neighbors were uh, sending pictures. They were staying mm. outside their homes because they were they were mm -hmm. afraid, mm -hmm. and everyone said, we can't believe this. On top of the Hurricane Maria, people didn't get anything from FEMA. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can verify, actually, a very interesting documentary from Cheryl Atkinson, where she says, this journalist says, where did the 91 billion of yeah. dollars in FEMA funds 
go. Well, Nobody. Is, yeah. Yeah. Then I wrote course, this yeah. letter because at that time I didn't have any idea of what else I could do to The Hague. Mm -hmm. Criminal International Court. Court. Yeah. And I accused Wanda Vasquez and I accused Rosamilia Rodriguez Vélez, mm -hmm. the attorney of the FBI Puerto Rico office, in that letter saying, you see, Harvard University published this research. They said 4,645 people in Puerto Rico died. You said the president died. of Harvard, too. I did. and I. So I, in the last minute we have, I did. what was the response? Because this the is important. The response was that uh, the Hague answer. They sent me an email and they said, sent us all the evidence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The United States does not participate in our yeah, agreement, right. but we will find ways to so. help with this. And I did. About a, three months later, Rosemilia Rodriguez Vélez, the attorney of the FAA Puerto Rico office, was fired by yes. the Department of Justice. Mm. And uh, as you can verify on the Wall Street Journal, where they publish everything, they said that the reason was due to the corruption with the FEMA phones. So at the end, the letter that I sent was apparently pretty effective. I didn't do it myself. I had to, I talked to the researchers in Harvard that published this investigation. And I sent about probably 2,000 letters about this issue. Right. But people was very, they felt that they were, they, they did not count on this. Well, we are, unfortunately yeah. running out of time, but it does show that people can stand up, make a difference. We are ending the show and thank you so very, very much. We are ending it with a, a clip from Harry Belafonte who passed on. Mm -hmm.